All right, beautiful people. We live in both places now. million pins and it's always hard for me for me to find just one but we're about to need pins so I buy more pins and everybody need pins and I can't find pins that I bought when I need them so I tell you you gotta love kids happy Wednesday everybody let's write down my little daily notes Mashiach. All right, beautiful people. It is Wednesday, November the 17th, 2021. Day 304 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets. And of the three-year consecutive day count, day 971. You know what? That's without the Sabbath and the feast day. Sabbath day is added in because we will over the thousand day count well over the thousand day count if we add those in if we had every single day of the year in we'd be way past the thousand day mark but these days are just the days that we are present not including the sabbath days nor the other days that we miss <laughs> during my vacation right um so today, y'all, we're reading Psalm 107 to Psalm 109. Then we're going to pick up what we left off at yesterday in chapter 9. We should be able to finish up the rest of chapter 9 today. If, if not, start in chapter 10 a little bit. <laughs> Just gain some, some time that we kind of, uh, I story timed away. <laughs> All right, y'all, so we're going to pick that back up on page 238. Mom, shalom, Levon. Blessings. Trina, hey, girl, hey, Batwabu. Peace and blessings, Tiffany. All right, y'all, let's go ahead and get moving. Go ahead and do the Shema and get rolling. Let's see if we gain back some of our time today. So I'm just, I'm just ready to start the portion about Revelation. All right. Shema is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting at verse 3. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase mightily, as Yahuwah, the mighty one of our fathers, has promised us in a land that flows of milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, our mighty one, he is one, and you shall love Yahuwah, your mighty one, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of your house and your gates. I mean, your will. And Yahuwah commanded us to do all these statutes to fear him, Yahuwah, our mighty one, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before you who are mighty one as he has commanded us. All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and pull this up. Psalm 107. Oh, this print is a little bigger today. Mm, okay. Let's see if click something. All right, y'all. Psalm 107. This actually starts book five. There are five books recorded here in this book of Psalms. Um, and these are the rest of the chapters starting at 107 all the way to Psalm 150. Give thanks to Yahuwah for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has Yahuwah redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies, for he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, north and south. Some wander in the wilderness, lost and homeless, hungry and thirsty. They nearly died. Yah, help! They cried in their trouble, and he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. 
Let them praise Yahuwah for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. They rebelled against the words of Yah, scorning the counsel of the Most High. That is why he broke them with hard labor. They fell and no one was there to help them. Yah, help! They cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He led them from the darkest and deepest gloom. He snapped their chains. Let them praise Yahuwah for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he broke down their prison gates of bronze. He cut apart their bars of iron. Some were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food, and they were knocking on death's door. Yah, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. Let them praise Yahuwah for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Some went off to sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed Yahuwah's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest sea. He spoke and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards, and they were at their wits' end. Yah, help! they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing that stillness was as he brought them safely into harbor. Let them praise Yahuwah for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. He changes rivers into deserts and springs of water into dry, thirsty land. He turns the fruitful land into salty wastelands because of the wickedness of those who live there. But he also turns deserts into pools of water, the dry land into springs of water. He brings the hungry to settle there and to build their cities. They sow their fields, plant their vineyards, and harvest their bumper crops. How he blesses them. They raise large families there, and their herds of livestock increase. When they decrease in number and become impoverished, impoverished through oppression, trouble, and sorrow, Yahuwah pours contempt on their princes, causing them to wander in trackless wastelands. But he rescues the poor from trouble and increases their families like flocks of sheep. The godly will see things and be glad. I'm sorry. The godly will see these things and be glad, while the wicked are struck silent. Those who are wise will take all this to heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Right? Next chapter, y'all. Psalm chapter 108. A song. A psalm of David. My heart is confident in you, O Yah. No wonder I can sing your praises with all my heart. Wake up, lyre and harp. I wake the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Yah, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations, for your unfailing love is higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O Yah, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. Now rescue your beloved people. Answer and save us by your power. Yahuwah has promised us this by his holiness. I will divide up Shechem with joy. I will measure out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine and Manasseh too. Ephraim, my helmet, will produce my warriors. And Judah, my scepter, will produce my kings. But Moab, my wash basin, will become my servant. And I will wipe my feet on Edom and shout in triumph over Philistia. Who will bring me into the fortified city? Who will bring me victory over Edom? Have you rejected us, O Yah? Will you no longer march with our enemies? Oh, please help us against our enemies, for all human help is useless. With Yahuwah's help, we will do mighty things, for he will trample down our foes. 
Last chapter for the day, Psalm chapter 109. This is for the choir director, a Psalm of David. O oh, Yah, whom I praise, don't stand silent and aloof while the wicked slander me and tell lies about me. They surround me with hateful words and fight against me for no reason. I love them, but they try to destroy me with accusations, even as I am praying for them. They repay evil for good and hatred for my love. They say, get an evil person to turn against him. Send an accuser to bring him to trial. When his case comes up for judgment, let him be pronounced guilty. Count his prayers as sins. Let his years be few. Let someone else take his position. May his children become fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander as beggars and be driven from their ruined homes. May creditors seize his entire estate and strangers take all he has earned. Let no one be kind to him. Let no one pity his fatherless children. May all his offspring die. May his family name be blotted out in the next generation. May Yahuwah never forget the sins of his fathers. May his mother's sin never be erased from the record. I mean, who could be that mad with you? Joy, shalom, shalom. Yahuwah is one. Yes, may the spirit of Yahuwah bless and guide us. May Yahuwah never forget the sins of his fathers. May his mother's sin never be erased from the record. May Yahuwah always remember these sins and may his name disappear from human memory. For he refused all kindness to others. He persecuted the poor and needy. For he hounded the brokenhearted to death. He loved to curse others. Now you curse him. He never blesses others. Now don't you bless him. Cursing is as natural to him as his clothing, or the water he drinks, or the rich food he eats. Now may his curses return and cling to him like clothing, and may they be tied around him like a belt. Sheesh. Now that's how you curse somebody. You want to curse somebody out? You ain't got to say, <laughs> uh, what do you want to call it? We call curse words today, um, I, I would say that's, um, Fillers for lack of vocabulary. That's what I call them. Like the F-bomb and stuff like that. I'll just say they're fillers for lack of the right vocabulary, the right passionate vocabulary that you want to use at that moment. Shayla, hey girl, hey. It says, now may his curses return and cling to him like clothing and may they be tied around him like a belt. May those curses become Yahuwah's punishment. For my accusers who speak evil of me, but deal well with me, O sovereign Yah, for the sake of your own reputation. Rescue me because you are so faithful and good. For I am poor and needy and all my heart is full of pain. I am fading like a shadow at dust. I am brushed off like a locust. My knees are weak from fasting and I am skin and bones. I am a joke to people everywhere. When they see me, they shake their heads and scorn. Help me, O oh, Yah, my God. Save me because of your unfailing love. Let them see that this is your doing, that you yourself have done it, Yah. Then let them then let them curse me if they like, but you will bless me. When they attack me, they will be disgraced. But I, your servant, will go right on rejoicing. May my accusers be clothed with disgrace. May their humiliation cover them like a cloak. But I will give repeated thanks to Yah, praising him to everyone. For he stands beside the needy, ready to save them from those who condemn them. And that, my beautiful people, is our reading for today. So let's go ahead and hop on over here to the rest of chapter 9 in Shakespeare's Secret Mashiach. Messiah. Okay. So we're going back and forth with Jessica and Lorenzo, who was the daughter. What was his name? I forgot his name. Shylock's daughter. Right? Okay. So we're picking this up. And this is a. Uh, I said I was going to go back. Hold on. Did I? I was going to go back. 
but I didn't mark the place I was going to go back to. Okay, let's just go. Um, let's just go back to after this incoherent conversation between Jessica and Lorenzo. Okay. Therefore, one of the incoherent aspects of the conventional understanding of the play is that Jessica and Lorenzo seem to be rewarded for their immoral behavior at its conclusion. We also know that Shylock stated that he intended to take revenge. As he put it, quote, the villainy you teach me, I will execute and it shall go hard, but I will be better than instruction, end quote. That's act three, scene one, line 59 through 68. In other words, the playwright has indicated that Shylock intended to gain revenge upon his wicked Christian instructors. But what was the bettering the instruction that Shylock claimed he was going to do? Viewing the play as a counterattack against the satire in the Gospels makes these seemingly illogical elements coherent. <clears throat> From such a perspective, Shylock did not consent to the Gentiles judgment after all he merely he merely said that he was content with it not that he would obey the dictum in fact he was content because he knew that the judgment gave him a chance to accomplish just what he said he would that is to better the instruction of Christianity under this scenario the original deed of gift was not signed, but rather a different one described in the final scene as a special deed of gift, which merely left Jessica and Lorenzo all of his possessions at death. But what did Shylock actually leave to his immoral daughter and her Christian husband? If he did not convert to Christianity, then he had no possessions other than his unexercised entitlement to the pound of anthony's flesh and here's where we um the reader picks up today one of the key themes of the play is that there is much talk of food and lorenzo has constantly been expecting to eat however as time goes on dinner is continually failing to appear quote and this is a couple quotes but i'm gonna just say quote at the beginning of all of them and then at the end of all of them we too will leave you, but at dinner time, I pray you have in mind where we must eat. Act 1, scene 1, line 70. We will leave you too until dinner time. Act 1, scene 1, line 105. Nay, we will slink away at dinner time. Act 3, scene 11, line 1. Whither thou goest, Mary, sir, to bid my oldest master, the Jew, to sup tonight with my new master, the Christians. Act 2, scene 4, line 15. Even in the lovely garnish of a boy. Act 2, scene 4, line 45. End quote. The conventional interpretation of the play does not provide any resolution to Lorenzo's hunger and at the play's conclusion, he is famished. He should have eaten at five in the evening, but has been up all night and it is almost and it is now almost morning. At this point in the play, the playwright deliberately takes the reader into a context concerning the sacrament of communion. Lorenzo tells Jessica, quote, Look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with pattiness of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in this, but in his motion, like an angel sings, still choiring to the young eyed cherubims. End quote. Act 5, scene 1, line 59 through 62. These pattings are the plates of which the Eucharist is served. Lorenzo's words can be compared to the te diem, T-E space D-E-U-M, which is generally sung after mass on certain important occasions. Quote, To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein, to thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry. End quote. 
Portia then delivers something to the staving Lorenzo that he calls manna. It says staving, maybe it means starving, but staving could be another word for starving. I think it should say starving. Maybe it's a typo. Maybe it's not. I'll read it again. Portia then delivers something to the starving Lorenzo that he calls manna. What sort of food was this manna? It was a special deed to Antonio's pound of flesh. Quote, Portia, how now, Lorenzo? My clerk has some good comforts, too, for you. Nerissa, a, hey, and I'll give, and I'll give them him without a fee. There do I give to you and Jessica from the rich Jew a special deed of gift after his death, after his death of all he dies possessed of. Lorenzo, fair ladies, you drop manna in the way of starved people. Portia, it is almost morning, and yet I am sure you are not satisfied. End quote. Act 5, scene 1, line 288. The, word, the Hebrew word manna refers to the food that came down from heaven in the book of Exodus. Seeing the substance, the Israelite responded, manna, meaning what is this? So Lorenzo and Jessica also called their inheritance manna as they do not know it is the flesh of Antonio. Their confusion reverses that of the Jews at the Last Supper. Jesus also referred to manna, of course. He referred to it as the food of his body. It is not hard to see that Shylock has bettered the instructions of those who created Christianity by presenting the Gentiles with nothing but human flesh. The imagery concerning the pound of flesh in the Merchant of Venus comes from Sir Giovanni's collection of Italian stories, two per con um, I think I said that wrong, per, per coron, okay, two picaron, the big sheep, that was published in 1558 in Italian. The concept of a pound of flesh also appeared in Alexander Silvan's The Orator, translated into English in 1596. When he first mentions this forfeit, Shylock says that it is an, quote, equal pound of your fair flesh to be cut off and what part of your body pleases me, end quote. That's Act 2, Scene 2, line 149 through 150. In the play, the word bond is repeated numerous times. This agreement is a merry bond, M-E-R-R-Y. Act 1, Scene 3, line 169. Shylock insists, quote, I will have my bond, end quote. Act 3, Scene 3, line 4 through 17. And Portia asks whether Antonio, quote, confess the bond, end quote. Act 4, Scene 1, line 178 through 8. But why does Portia require that the piece of flesh is to be cut out of Antonio's breast rather than taken off his left hand? One answer, of course, is that it is logical to the storyline, but another is that the author has created a Hebrew pun. The Hebrew word for bond is oze, O-Z-E-H, or well, that's that's how he spelled it here for, you know, for you to see. Adiah Shalom. The Hebrew word for bond is oze. And the Hebrew word for breast is aze. Thus, the inheritance that Shylock left was the bond that he predicted he would have when he said, quote, I will have my bond. Also, in Hebrew, the same word, that mean it's d m m but they add the you know the vowels inside of it the a and the i and he spells it up here d a m i m d a m i m okay 
also in Hebrew, the same word damim means both money and blood, which explains Portia's view that at the expiration of the bond, Shylock is entitled to take neither money nor blood from Anthony, but only flesh. And that's reference 91 in the back. Shylock's name is also part of the playwright's satirical system. It is a play on Shiloh, Genesis 49 and 10, a Hebrew word meaning the Messiah. The play reverses the gospel's satire, whereby Jews unwittingly eat the flesh of the Jewish Messiah and, cause that, and causes that fate to fall. Oh, I'm reading too fast. Let me go back. It is a play on Shiloh, Genesis 49 and 10, a Hebrew word meaning the Messiah. The play reverses the gospel's satire, whereby Jews unwittingly eat the flesh of the Jewish Messiah and causes that fate to fall instead upon Gentiles and Jews who convert to Christianity. The author has used her understanding that the sacrament of communion is a cannibal feast to create a parody that will be visible to those that know the real nature of Christianity. Clear, we found that out shortly after we began to read the Torah over and over a few times, right? That was one of the first things I began to take issue with. I'm like, um... Uh... Bassano, Portia, and Anthony are left in a more complex and conflicted situation. Portia, masquerading as Balthazar, demanded that Bassano give up the wedding ring that symbolized his love and commitment to Portia. Under Anthony's prodding, Bassanio agreed to yield the ring to Balthazar. When Portia, as a woman, confronts her husband about the faux pas, Antonio steps forward to pledge himself again as security for Bassano's faithfulness. Quote, Antonio, once I did lend my body for his wealth, which but for him that had your husband's ring had quite miscarried, I dare be bound again, my soul upon the forfeit, that your Lord will never more break faith advisedly. Portia, then you shall be his surety. Give him this and bid him keep it better than the other. Antonio, here, Lord Bassanio, swear to keep this ring. End quote. But Antonio's soul is forfeit at the moment he makes the pledge because Bassanio must still love Antonio as much as he did before. And Portia has cleverly staged a wedding ceremony between Antonio and Bassanio. Bassanio's love for Antonio is a Shakespearean riddle in the play. If Antonio represents the Christ and Bassanio is a crypto Jew, then why doesn't Bassanio hate Antonio and crave revenge rather than love and friendship? This is quickly followed by another riddle as Portia announces. Quote, Portia, Antonio, you are welcome, and I have better news in store for you than you expect. Unseal this letter soon. There you shall find three of your Argoses are richly come to harbor suddenly. You shall not know by what strange accident I chanced on this letter. Antonio, I am dumb. End quote. How have Anthony's Argoses come safely ashore? And where did Portia get this information? Within the Flavian comic system, one sputters to come up with a solution based on Anthony's loss of his soul, as well as his pound of flesh. It seems that he is in some way a soulless zombie or dead man walking, so it makes sense that he is dumb. How are we to explain Bassanio's love for such an empty shell? Is it possible that privateers captured Antonio's ships 
which have richly come to harbor indeed, but now belong to Portia. Queen Elizabeth was notorious for funding her government with proceeds from pirate raids. Does Anthony represent the Anglican church now safely domesticated, purged of all vitrolic Flavian baggage and ready at the queen's service? I will leave it to the reader to decide whether these solutions to Shakespeare's riddles are adequate or, or whether the enigmas remain unsolved. The deeper structure of the play shows that far from being anti-Semitic, the Merchant of Venus is completely pro-Jewish. The playwright created an anti-Semitic surface narration that would have appealed to the audiences of Elizabethan England, but contained a subtext whose perspective was just the opposite. This is especially clear in Shylock's famous monologue concerning how Gentiles have treated Jews. The speech is the real voice of Amelia Bassano trying to use empathy to elevate humankind to a more humane treatment of one another. Quote, He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heeded mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Have not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warm and cooled by the same winter and summer as the Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge? If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. End quote. Act 3, scene 1, line 60. Amelia ain't playing with y'all. <laughs> or rather, shall I say, Shakespeare. It is difficult not to speculate on Amelia's mental state while she produced such complex literature. Studies of artistic personalities suggest that about half of them suffer from depressive or manic depressive illness. Both Emilia's father and one of her first cousins reportedly suffered from depression. This is notable because blood, because blood relatives of those suffering from psychic ab ab I'm sorry, abnormality are much more likely to suffer from manic depressive illness by I'm sorry, let me start that again. I was about to pronounce that word wrong. This is notable because blood relatives of those suffering from psychic abnormality are much more likely to suffer from manic depressive illness be psychotic cyclothmic or to commit suicide compared to the general population. Extreme situations, however, can also produce unusual psychic states, and Amelia's personal situation was difficult. She lived in a pre-Darwinian world where the notion that life had been brought about by some method other than divine intervention was seldom considered. Some of her literature suggests that she was deeply religious. For example, her belief in God showed in the cryptic de dedication to Mr. Yahweh she wrote for her sonnets given below. On the other hand, 
Hamlet's famous soliloquy shows that she was capable of contemplating a godless universe. This deep ambiguity, coupled with the understanding of the falseness of Christianity, would have made it difficult for her to doubt that Judaism embodied the truth. Yet eventually, she may have experienced earthquakes of uncertainty about that as well. Not only was Amelia a dark-skinned Jewish orphan in a fair world, and it has fair. He pretty much saying she's a black woman in the midst of a white world. That's how he, he put the quotes around fair. So you know what he's saying. Not only was Amelia a dark-skinned Jewish orphan in a fair world, but since she knew the true nature of the Gospels, she would have experienced that world as literally the triumph of evil over God. Perhaps this is what gave her the extraordinary energy necessary to produce such a body of writing. The early Amelia may have seen herself as religious... Hold on. Okay. The early Amelia may have seen herself as religious warrior sent by God to chastise, to chastise the Gentiles for their wickedness by taking satirically an eye for an eye as instructed in the Hebrew Bible. The later Amelia may have seen herself transformed as a vanguard of enlightenment and universalism. Such a progression would represent a very special kind of madness, if indeed that is what it was. I would not be surprised if the mind of Emilia Bassano would be the subject of much speculation in the years to come. Martavia, shalom, shalom. All right, y'all, and that is the end of chapter nine. We start in chapter 10. We'll be at 36 minutes. What's today? Wednesday? We ain't gonna finish it today. I'm still turning the page. Hold on. Whew. Okay. We can clear this by the end of tomorrow. Then we can start in chapter 11. All right, y'all. So we'll keep going. Chapter 10. Domitian's Trinity in Acts. During the period when I was analyzing the Shakespearean plays, I found that there was some symbolism in them that was incomprehensible to me. It seemed to have not been based on the typology the Flavians placed into the Gospels, but on a system unknown to me. My curiosity peaked. I began what turned out to be a long journey. To understand this typology required making the chain of discoveries that I will present in the next several chapters. Let me read that again. To understand this typology required making the chain of discoveries that I will present in the next several chapters. Domitian, who succeeded Titus as Caesar in 81 CE, was the last of the three Flavian Caesars, and like many of the Caesars before him, he enjoyed making representations of his divinity. Even today, the statues and inscriptions he created, portraying him as a god, litter the landscape of Asia Minor. Domitian's desire to be seen as a god existed even in his private life. Suetonius recorded that Domitian demanded to be addressed as Lord God by those that approached him. The New Testament works of Acts, Paul's letters, and the book of Revelation were among Domitian's efforts to see himself depicted as a god. Oh, we 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 getting right into the thick of it. Oh, look, I read this somewhere else, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad this is here. Look, y'all. Okay, I'm going to try to contain myself. The New Testament works of Acts. Paul's letters. Y'all ask, like, why is she getting so excited about this? I am so excited about revealing truth, right? And I like to take my time. It's like you got to see the buildup of the story and how you were taken right? How you were mentally taken and taken through loops and hoops, right? And a lot of people is like, you can't reconcile all of this with the spiritual and supernatural things you have experienced, right? I'm telling you, 
they are separate things and can happen with anybody anywhere anybody can tap into the realm of the unseen your faith if you believe in something so much you will begin to have results from it right you don't necessarily have to be a christian to experience a, a miracle from god so to speak right you can be a a atheist somewhere or a, a a hindu or somebody deep in buddhism or whatever and your faith and whatever you believe will render you results right it don't matter who you call on it's your faith that move that moves things so to speak right because if you have faith in something if you truly have faith in something what you will tend to notice, not those that just, you know, I'm going to toss a prayer out here and go on about my day. People who are deeply spiritual, what happens is, and you'll notice this if you pay attention. People who are truly spiritual and they're believing something, they're waiting on something, they will tend, whether consciously or unconsciously, they will tend to begin to align their lives up in order to receive the answer for that prayer. They don't they don't just casually toss prayers out there and go on about their day. They will pray prayers and they will begin watching for opportunities or looking for things. Or if they need to take an action, they'll begin taking an action. And it's not something that's specific to Christianity. That's specific to every human person on this earth that has faith. It's, it's an unseen law that happens for any and everybody. That's why you can hear people from different backgrounds, ethnicities, religions say that they experience things, at least those who are deeply spiritual. They experience things because they're operating on the same principle that they don't realize that Yahuwah has made universal, right? And they just kind of lump things and throw it over into different places like it's specific just to this group of people. And it's absolutely not, right? Look. Let me keep going. The New Testament works of Acts, Paul's letters, and the book of Revelation were among Domitian's efforts to see himself depicted as a god. These works were designed to map onto Suetonius' history of Domitian's life using typological parallels in the same way that the Gospels were mapped onto Josephus' history of Titus's military campaign. Many scholars believe that the Gospel of John was created after the Synoptic Gospels. I concur with this judgment and will show that this Gospel was written or at least heavily redacted during the reign of Domitian. The section of the typology that Domitian controlled is difficult to understand because it was intended to transcend Titus's typology. In the same way, in the same way that Titus had morphed his typology onto the Jewish messianic prophecies to show that he was the Christ that scripture predicted, Domitian built his typology on top of his brothers. In other words, by winning a petty literary game of Christ typology one-upmanship, Domitian intended to show posterity that it was he, not his dead brother, who was the final Christ whom Christians have unknowingly worshipped. Surprises are always possible for those who try to make themselves immortal gods, of course. And Domitian suffered a complete reversal of both his role as Caesar and the literary legacy he tried to create. Domitian was assassinated in 96 CE at age 45, and the Senate passed Damnatio Memorae against him. That's D A M N A T I O. M-E-M-O-R-I-A-E. -E. Domitian was assassinated in 96 CE at age 45, and the Senate passed Damnatio Memorae against him, ending his aspiration to become a divus like his father and brother before him. Domitian's assassination may be related to his executions 
of his secretary, Ephroditus, and the consul, Titus Flavius Clemens, and the exile of Flavia Domatilla. These characters were all notable for their possible affiliation with early Christianity. And Ephroditus was mentioned in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, and Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, as a companion of Apostle Paul. And Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews was also dedicated to an Ephroditus, and if indeed these were all the same person. And as shown in Caesar's Messiah, Titus Flavius Clemens was identified in early church literature as the first Roman Pope after Peter himself. What? Y'all see? That's my morning squirrel. Y'all can't see him, but now he's climbing on the window. Okay. I'm like, what in the world? Okay. He normally just comes sit on the ledge. I don't know that he can hear me or she. I don't know if it's a male or female squirrel. But anyway, this squirrel... I don't always call it out, but this squirrel, every morning when I'm sitting here reading, he come and sit right here on the ledge, and he'll walk back and forth. Sometimes he'll come over here, although y'all can't see it. Now he decided to climb up. I don't know. Maybe he's trying to get in. He want to get a, a closer listen. I don't know. Okay. What did I stop at? Oh, okay. And as shown in Caesar's Messiah, Titus Flavius Clemens was identified in early church literature as the first Roman Pope after Peter himself, as well as the author of the Epistle of Clement and the propagandist of the Suedo Clementine recognitions and homilies. However, this Titus Flavius Clemens is not to be confused with the theologian Titus Flavius, Titus Flavius Clemens also known as Clement of Alexandria, mentioned below. He do. He be trying to hear the word, Robert. <laughs> Domitian's reign ended in a palace coup. According to Suetonius, the conspiracy was headed by Domitian's chamberlain, Parthenius, an associate of Aphrodite's, and by a steward of Flavia Domitilla, the wife of the executed consul. Domitian's irrationality was increasingly seen as the real problem and perhaps cooler, more bureaucratic minds prevailed. Ultimately, a provincial military operative by Trajan emerged, apparently with the backing of the powerful Piso family and Christianity was sent in yet another direction. <laughs> Trajan's victory will be the topic of the third volume in Caesar's Messiah trilogy. It's going to be another book. <laughs> Look, hopefully, like I said the last time, when, right when we was getting done with Caesar's Messiah, I was like, y'all, I don't know what we're reading next. I, he talked about this other book, but I can't find it. And then like a couple days, of, uh, not a couple, maybe like four days before we literally ended Caesar's Messiah, I found it. And I was looking in the wrong place because in Caesar's Messiah, he gave it a title that they actually changed. And they changed it to Shakespeare's Secret Messiah. So hopefully, it was this row. Hold on. Oh, y'all. This was followed up, written in um, 2014. So, we're in 2021. Brother had some time to pull this third book together, right? So, I'm hoping. I'm going to start looking for it, right? He called this Caesar's Messiah Trilogy. This is the second book. So, hopefully, y'all, he done with the third one. I didn't even realize it would be a third one to just now. So, I'm going to start looking for it. I'm going to start looking for it. Um, okay, look. They it might it, it could be done, but it may not be this title. Listen to what he said. Trajan's victory will be the topic of the third volume in the Caesar's Messiah trilogy, which is now being prepared under the working title Spiritual Bazaar Wars and a Jewish a Jewess Strikes Back. Okay. So if y'all got that, somebody try and look it up. I'll look it up. But it said, under the working title. So you may not be able to find it. It could be like 
this where they gave it a, a working title, putting it together, but they actually changed it, which why it took me so long to find it. So um, we'll see. Hopefully they finish with it and I'll be able to pick it out. I'm going to just look for Caesar's Messiah Trilogy, you know. Okay, look, let me just, I'm excited. Let me go back. Trajan's Victory will be the topic of the third volume in Caesar's Messiah Trilogy, which is now being prepared under the working title, Spiritual Bizarre Wars and A Jewess Strikes Back. This third volume will be forthcoming soon, and anyone who follows me to the end of this journey will be rewarded with buried golden treasure. Or at any rate, I will, pre I will be providing a map. I need all the maps. <laughs> we need everything we can, right? We need everything we can get our hands on to help us unscramble this puzzle we've been thrown into, right? When we landed on this earth. Meanwhile, Domitian's reign started smoothly enough. After gaining the throne, he began to add on to the Gospels that his brother Titus created. Domitian either expanded or introduced the bizarre character of the Holy Spirit, thereby creating the Trinity. The zany Christian concept of a Godhead somehow shared by three individuals remember i think it was yesterday right how i said that that's that seemed odd to me when i was saying the holy spirit i used to think it was this third person which is exactly how christianity teaches it to you but in my ignorance i was still referring i was talking to y'all but i was still referring to him as this third person which is why he said look it's me it's always been me, right? At least who I've been talking to, right? Okay, so about, they're about to break this down, y'all. That's why I said, although it may not necessarily be wrong if, you, if you're ignorant. I can't say not wrong, right? Um, if you're ignorant, you who would know that you're ignorant and you you talking to him, but you're calling him by another name. It's like you're ignorant like my name, Pam, right? I don't know how you get Patricia out of Pam. Some people, oh, Patricia, and just, just be talking to me like they so right. And I'm like, Patricia, who she, but she's staring at me, talking, mm -hmm, I'm listening. Like, I hope she's, is she talking to me? Look, oh, I'm the only, and I'll just bust out sometime. What you call me? Did you call me Patricia? My name is not Patricia. And they pause like, oh, snap. My name is Pam. I don't know how you got Patricia out of Pamela, but maybe the P and the A at the end of both of them. I don't know. You got something. You like got lost in translation somewhere <laughs> between the P and the A at the end, but it's not Patricia, it's Pamela. Um, sort of kind of like the same thing, maybe, right? So that's why I said I stopped using those, I call them extracurricular terms now, or extracurricular names, or I, that's why I just refer to Yahuwah as Yahuwah. Yahuwah, call if I'm calling them by name, I ain't like Yahoo. Yeah, all these other different names people coming up with. And I, I can see the theory and the logic in some of what they're saying. But it, it gets confusing, especially to people who are just really trying to get a grip on what's going on. Like, wait a minute, it's too much. What did Israel call him? They called him. We're going to stick. Even if we need to cut the end of it off, Yah. You can't go wrong with Yah, right? The universal praise Term is hallelujah, all praises to Yah. We, you can't go wrong with Yah, right? Okay. So that's why I said I stopped using the word Holy Spirit. And I, I just, any kind of intuition or whatever, where I know it's his voice, because it was all, it will always be that voice where I know it was Yah, right? I'm like, thank you, Yah, right? Okay, look. Meanwhile, Domitian's reign started smoothly enough. After gaining the throne, he began to add on to the Gospels that his brother Titus created. Domitian either expanded or introduced the bizarre character of the Holy Spirit, thereby creating the Trinity, the zany Christian concept of a Godhead somehow shared by three individuals. Although the Holy Spirit is mentioned many times in the three synoptic Gospels, 
and also in the Old Testament, it is typically referred to as an aspect of divinity that descends and fills a righteous person with godliness at important moments. As Margaret Barker explained in The Great Angel, a study of Israel's second God, reference 92 in the back, this view may have stemmed from the two ancient gods visible in the J and the E sources of the Torah, that is Yahweh and El, respectively. Yahweh was seen as being the more accessible of the two and more involved in human affairs, while El was more fatherly and remote. Thus, Yahweh was associated with the Holy Spirit that would descend upon the Messiah. There was no Hebrew concept of a Holy Spirit that was a third distinct entity within the Godhead. <laughs> Robert, man, I have to catch myself saying, Lord, have mercy. I know sometimes it's like you got to get when you just understanding everything, you got to catch yourself. Even in some of the earlier videos where I'm adjusting you will see me, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I, I'll just be like, mm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. Mm, Father, forgive me. I'm sorry. I didn't mean, you know, you got to work it out of yourself. Like, you got to work out your own soul's salvation, right? So, it, it kind of takes a while, and you catch yourself. But once you do it, it'll, it's just retraining, retraining yourself, you know. Yeah. His name alone, Adai. Yes. Hallelujah. There was no Hebrew concept of a Holy Spirit that was a third distinct entity within the Godhead. The dualist concept of deity was consistent with the views of the Roman imperial court, and it was consistent with the initial formulation of Flavian Christianity. Vespasian, who was God the Father, and Titus, the Son of God, presumably did not see any need to include Domitian in the system of typology in the synoptic gospels because he had not fought with them on the Judean battlefield. To correct this slight to his divinity, Domitian promoted the Holy Spirit to be to become a fully co-equal partnership with the Father and the Son in his contributions to the New Testament. So y'all worshiping, all y'all getting dunked under the water <laughs> at the baptismal pool. No, dunk me in the name of all three. That's what you want? Okay. In the name of Vespasian, Domitian, and Titus. <laughs> That's who you really being dunked in. But they just using the, the, the cover-up titles of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's <laughs> about to say something else. Let me keep reading, y'all. We only got a few minutes left. Look. I'll just read that again. The dualist concept of deity. Matter of fact, that might be our title today. Hold on. Let me think about it. The dualist concept of deity. Some people really loud. Some people really get pissed with me. <laughs> I'll be careful. I'm not really trying to drive people away or really anger them. But I really just want to get them to think, right? Because sometimes I get some nasty grounds from people. And I, I ain't going to say it's funny. But I'd be cracking up. But I get it. And only and I'm not I'm not laughing at them. Let me be clear. Let me be clear. I'm not laughing at them. I'm laughing because I used to be them. And I would be like, oh, don't you dare say nothing bad about my Lord. <laughs> like, seriously, like I was ridiculous. Right, right. No baptism in Torah, also. You got that right, Adaya. Absolutely. It's breaking all these habits. Like what Joy said, breaking all these habits we've been taught in Christianity. There was no baptism in Torah, right? People talk about it sometimes. We ain't, ain't going to mess with it too much, right? Because it talks about a, a mikvah, right? You cleanse yourself. But a mikvah is totally different from a baptism where you're baptizing somebody in like a pool or still water. A mikvah is more like a cleansing and when they mikvah they didn't go in a still pool of water it was actually a flowing river right you didn't stay there being which is probably why i don't know i'm getting ahead of myself they didn't dunk people in a pool of still water right um 
like you heard this saying, you go down the devil and you come back up a wet devil. Right. Because it's just that you just, you're in your pool of filth, right? But just, you know, think about it. But a mikvah is standing in a flowing river as they wash themselves or cleanse themselves. So that whatever was on them is, is passing away. It's going up the river. It's not standing there. They're not, it's not like this dirty soup that you're standing in. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You need to be dunked again. No, it ain't none of that foolishness. And I don't mean, mean, mean to make fun of people because I did it. I did it. That's why it's so funny to me. Because now that I realize what in the world we was doing, I'm like, oh, we were so retarded. <laughs> like, we don't just pay a, We just don't pay attention to nothing, right? That's why things be so funny to me. So, I'm not laughing at people or making fun of them. But I laugh so hard because, like I said, I used to be them, right? And I'm just like, man, I can't believe I used to do that same thing, right? So try to enlighten people. So it's more of a mix for where they stand in a, a flowing pool, not a flowing pool, but like a river. It it has a, a, a inlet and an outlet and it goes into a bigger pool or bigger body of water. It, you know, that, that water you never see again, right? Um, but that's like another whole, that's another whole thing, right? Hold on. The dualist concept of deity. Hold on. Did I? What did I do? Oh, that's what I did. I went back. Okay. The dualist concept of deity was consistent with the views of the Roman emperor court, cult. And it was consistent with the initial formulation of Flavian Christianity. Vespasian, God the Father, and Titus, son of God, presumably did not see any need to include Domitian in a system of typology in the Synoptic Gospels because he had not fought with them on the Judean battlefield. To correct this slight to his divinity, Domitian promoted the Holy Spirit to become a fully co-equal partnership with the Father and the Son in his contributions to the New Testament. Let me see. Do I want to stop right here? Because we... I think, let me read this last... Uh... Let me read this last little paragraph. A clearly Trinitarian formulation only occurs in the synoptic gospels of matthew 28 verse 19 quote therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit which many scholars believe was a late interpolation in a few other passages in the synoptic gospels jesus refers to the holy spirit as a distinct entity from the son of man but the use of this latter term is arguably enigmatic the view of the holy spirit as an equal member of the trinity becomes clearer in the gospel of john and is fully developed in revelation and the epistles of paul it is interesting to note that the spirit that is numia, P-N-E-U-M-A. I'm sorry, I said Numa. Numa. Yeah, Numa, I think, was also a technical term of the imperial cult that was used to describe the spirit of the emperor that existed within his statues. Reference 93. One interesting example of Domitian's typology is the Doubting Thomas story, which requires that the reader already possess many facts necessary excuse me, to understand the story's subtle linkages to the history of the Roman legions. First, one must recognize that Gemini is a Greek word like Didymos. For twin, which is also the meaning of the Hebrew name Thomas. Moreover, 
the reader must also be aware that the legion XIV Roman numeral, what is that? Uh, 15? No, no, I'm sorry. The X is 10, 14. I think that's 14. I think. Moreover, the reader must also be aware that the Legion 14 or XIV Jemina did not back Vespasian in his effort to seize the throne and thus it became an actual historical basis for the concept of a doubting Thomas. Following Vespasian's ascension, the Legion was renamed as 14, if that's what their Roman numeral is, XIV, Flavia Firma, in order to obliterate the memory of their disloyalty. In other words, the doubting twin was called by a different name. It was, although the doubting twin was called by a different name, it was still the same legion. This same legion was used in Domitian's campaign against the Moesians. Thus, John's gospel story can be read as an allegory in which Legion 14, the doubting Thomas, is testing Domitian's mettle as the living, the living Flavian God. And this time he wins their acceptance. Quote, now Thomas called the twin Didymos, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger in here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, how many sermons have been made on doubting Thomas? Boy, he's so retarded. <laughs> and Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. End quote. And that's John chapter 20, verses 25 through 29. The Greek word describing imprint was tupos, meaning type. That is, a person or thing prefiguring the future. The typology is quite oblique, and the reader must be reading the gospel story, looking for connections to Domitian and Vespasian to recognize it. However, if this analysis is correct, Domitian must have been the one who added the story of doubting Thomas to the Gospels, as his military victory seemed to be its focus. Thus, by tracing the typology, it is possible to see the sequence of the writing of the four Gospels. In other words, the synoptics were created first under Vespasian and Titus, while Domitian added the Gospel of John during his reign. Only those who had already grasped the Jesus Titus typology can understand Domitian's typology concerning the number three. Domitian built his typology upon his brothers for a reason. He was concerned with his legacy relative to his more famous brother. And thus the purpose for his typology was to communicate to those individuals who already stood on who already understood Titus's. He did not wish Titus to be the only Flavian leaving a message to posterity about his Christian divinity. And I am going to pause right there. All right, y'all. So hopefully, and I think we will, tomorrow we'll be able to finish. Tomorrow is Thursday. We'll be able to finish all this. But then we're going to break it. And Saturday morning, we're going to get into it. Yo, we're going to get into it. Start chapter 11. I'm going to make sure we finish the rest of this tomorrow. Ooh, yeah. 
today wednesday tomorrow thursday and then we'll be right on track so chapter 11 we start in revelation this is just a precursor to it i'm so excited <laughs> ready to uh, break some of these mental chains and strongholds on the mind for people that's out here acting crazy don't realize they acting crazy waiting for this particular jesus to crack the sky and to come swoop them up <laughs> to this non-existent heaven while the world just explodes right because that's what they teach you in christianity right jesus come get us now i'm ready to go i can't i can't do this anymore here and then they just go on living life like they could be taken at any moment not doing anything i'm just like y'all people don't y'all see this is another tactic to take everything you got <laughs> they didn't already took just about all the land but you about to give them the rest of the, the little front <laughs> backyard patio that you got Oh, you going to heaven? Put me in your wheel. <laughs> you ain't worried about Jesus saving your soul? We'll worry about that later. Go ahead. Put me in your wheel. And where are you going to leave a copy of it at? Boy, we have been taken. I know some people still don't believe it just yet. But this I do know. You will go to your grave. In every generation before Jesus the Christ comes back and swoop you to heaven. Now that seems like the ultimate blasphemy to Christian ears. And I'm going to probably lose a couple more subscribers today. <laughs> it never fails because I be keeping track of the subscribers, right? I don't really care, but it, it tells me I, I, I like to look for trends, right? Um... I look for trends. And when I say something like that, people who haven't been tuning in every day and they come back, oh, she did a video. Let me watch it today. But they didn't miss the last 40, right? They'll put it on just to verify that I'm a heretic. Yeah, I knew it. Unsubscribe, right? Then they'll unsubscribe. Then it'll 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 go up a couple more over the next few days. I'm like, I'm fine. But it, it, it teaches me that people, some people are not ready for the truth right some people choose to fairy tale land is more comfortable to some people and i understand it i, I get that right i mean but you can't live in la la land all your life right i'm just i'm, I'm gonna leave people alone <laughs> slow show i'm gonna leave them alone today i'm gonna leave them alone i'm gonna leave them alone all right y'all but if you come in here, you just know what you're coming for. Like, you came to my house. This was going on in my house. If you don't like what's going on, get out. Right? Don't come here. Start in trouble. Calling me names. Trying to curse me out and stuff. Because I don't believe in your Jesus and you trying to save my soul. Oh, this one, this one lady. I don't know if she's still a, if she still watch me on the sly. I mentioned this before. I think I forget which video was on. But she she told me off and told me that if I didn't repent, I was gonna I was gonna burn in the fiery pits of hell. And she, I thought you was a sister. I gotta let everybody know you are of the devil. I'm like, oh, like, like it's a long paragraph that she wrote telling me off, and that if I did not come back to Jesus, that I would pretty much live with Satan for the rest of my life. I'm just like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> Boy, it is November the 17th, 2021. Day 304 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets. Day 900, hold on, of the three consecutive day count. Day 972, we read Psalm 107 through 109. And then we read the rest of chapter 9 in Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, starting on page 238. And we paused in chapter 10 on page, I think it was 250. Yeah, two, at the top of page 250. Okay. All right, y'all. So we're going to pick up with the rest of this chapter and read all the rest of it tomorrow. Right? That way, go ahead, take a break. Pull yourself together and get ready for the shock of your life. 
those that been here, it ain't too much of a shot. It's just like, go ahead. Give it to me. I'm ready. I may not be ready, but I'm ready. Come on. <laughs> it don't get no better than this. That's what I need. I need the truth. Just keep going. Go ahead. Don't worry about my feelings. Just give it to me. Just, you ain't got to worry about how you going to say it. Just give it to me. Let me sort that out. But let me hear all the truth, right? You get prepared for that. Because that, that's that's how I am at this point. It's like, just, just give it to me. Give it to me how you got it. And let me decipher. Let me go through it. Let me go through it. And let me let me sort it out, right? I go back and forth with y'all with this, right? While I work out my own soul salvation. Bella! Loves this part of the day. To the baby. Come on, let's do this blessing real quick. Because we went over time. Hold on. The truth hurt, but it is what it is, Trina. You right. Truth hurts, and everybody say they want it, but just can't handle it. Obedient to y'all. Hold on. Adaya said they're JC. Are the elites that's trying to make their homes on Mars, thinking they escaped the mess they caused here on Earth? You better tell it to die. Like, really? Y'all gonna go to space? You who said? Even if you make the bonkers, if if you read the Old Testament, he said, even if you go down to the depths of the Earth, I'm gonna find you there. And I'm going to pull you up out the ground. I kind of, you know, ad lib that a little bit. But I'm going to try and go up to the sky. We're going to get you up there too. Because I said higher than all of this. And I can see everything. They are. They trying to escape. Look. <laughs> Hardhead. I agree that my family still get mad at me. when I, t I agree. My family still get mad at me when I tell them his name ain't Jesus still. Oh, boy. That, you want to get into a fight with a Christian? That's all you got to say. But, honey, that video was too funny. When I clicked that button yesterday, I only clicked it because I'm nosy. <laughs> and that's why I did it, Trina. Look, I was going to delete the button. But keeping with the theme that sometimes I play too much. <laughs> I left the button there. On the, She talking about, uh, look, Trina talking about the website that I set up, right? I'm getting everything in place, so. I can own all my content just in case one day YouTube said, we don't like you no more. Get out of here. Right? So I'm even working on setting up a live streaming from the website just in case social media don't work out for me in the future. Right? Hopefully, it's, it's, a, it's a good free avenue that we can use and we're going to utilize it till we can't utilize it no more. But I am preparing on the back end for when social media say, Pam, you got to go. We didn't left you up here too long. Waking too many people up and uh, it's affecting our pockets. So I'm preparing for that now. So, but she's talking about the website. If you go to the website, y'all, it's up. Um, if you go down towards the bottom where it says donations, y'all know how we feel about donations, right? We just don't take them. And I explained that there. And right there, I left. You know how on websites or ministry, people leave a button. And um, it says, click here to donate or to just say donate. I left the button there and I linked it to a video. <laughs> Robert, you said just nosy. And I put up there, instead of donation, I removed the word donation and I replaced it in all capital letters with an exclamation point and it said, this button doesn't work. So I knew some people would click the button anyway. So I linked the button to a video and I'm like, well, hey there. Thank you for coming to the web page. Didn't I just tell you that this button didn't work? You can't give donations, people. <laughs> so that's what that says. That's what she's talking about. <laughs> Trina, the button says, do not click. <laughs> so, so that's there. So check out the website, y'all. Give me some feedback. Oh, and if you don't quite understand how to pronounce the name, it actually says ministry, right? I was telling my mama, I was like, I don't know what to name this or to add on and uh, awaken to the truth to... You know, how people can say, oh, is this or uh, an organization? So I was thinking of a word, and I really didn't want to use anything that would connect me with the church, right? Like, I, I am not that. If you think you come in here to hear about Jesus, we not that, right? So I was like, we ain't using ministry. We ain't using 
like all these other things. So I'm thinking of all kind of synonyms for the word ministry. And I couldn't find anything. I was going to put like Awaken to Truth Bureau. But Bureau meaning you would have to have at least three or more. So it can't be a Bureau. What about administration? Well, I'm really the only administrator behind you. Nah, nah, no. What about Awaken to Truth Leadership? No, we they don't really sound. They don't really have a, you know. But I, I, it kept ministry. Just I'm like, ugh. I was like, I hate everything about that word. <laughs> but then I was sitting there, literally, literally for an hour, going back and forth on whether to add ministry to it or not, just for the sheer fact that I despise religious dogma, right? I, I despise it, and I didn't want to have any words on the website that that connects me with shenanigans. I'm all about exposing the shenanigans, right? So I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to use this word. I really don't. So, but then I was looking at, I was staring at the definition of it. And you know how it gives you pronunciations of words? That's what that says. So if you're like, is that mind street meant? No, it actually says ministry, but I'm just using the dictionary spelling of ministry. It makes me feel better because when people look at it, it's going to get their attention to whereas if they look at the regular spelling of ministry, oh, this got something to do with church, you know, and they, they just, you know, but if I, I did an upside down letter, you know, kind of represents, we'd be foolish over here a little bit, you know, like well, what it, what? What does this word say? Oh, it's ministry. But by this time, we're trying to figure out where they say mind strong, men, what? You didn't click on it to see what's going on. And you kind of see the shenanigans and uh, busting out the church, right? So I just wanted to say that about the name, you know. So I like to be fun and do fun stuff. But um, if you go there, that's what that says. Bella, what are you doing? What? Are you just going to drink the whole glass of creamer? You gonna drink? That's like it's an almond milk. You realize that's the creamer, right? And that's not even a sweet cream creamer. Did you, did you taste that? Gary okay, just wasted half my bottle of my oat milk creamer. Look. All right, but anyway, that's enough. That's enough. Big Will Warrior. Shalom. The fake narrative of JC is to give eternal life to their kind by way to their kind by way of murdering us and taking our organs. I don't disagree with that, Big Wheel. Do any of us understand that we were saying pleading the blood of Jesus or JC when we were majorly in Christianity? Yep. We understand that. We absolutely understand that, which is why we speak against it at every turn and corner that we can right thanks for showing i'm not sure how long you've been here big wheel uh, this is my first time seeing you um you may have commented before but it's my first time seeing you but yes we know and that's what our purpose is to expose the shenanigans of the church that had us growing up crazy right looking for this um this pansy type savior that's supposed to be coming to save us and that ain't what none of y'all is at all right okay y'all so let's go ahead and end this bell come on I'm about to do the blessing for real come on come on all right y'all the blessing is found in numbers chapter 6 verse 22 through 27 remember the first 21 verses is the nazarite vow and Yahuwah spake unto moses saying speak oh you got creamer right now speak unto aaron I'm sorry. Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On oh, this wise, ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahuwah will kneel before us, presenting gifts, and will guard us with the hedge of protection. Yahuwah will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us, bringing order, and he will provide us with love, sustenance, and friendship. Yahuwah will lift up the wholeness of his being and look down upon us, and he will set in place all we need to be whole and complete. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And if you're not familiar with that version, that's a more accurate rendering of Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. Where you're most likely familiar with hearing is this version from the KJV. This is essentially what we're saying, but we're doing it the way it should be said. But this is how you hear it from the KJV. 
And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahuwah bless us and keep us. Yahuwah make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people. That's it. We out of here. I love y'all. I will see y'all back here tomorrow morning, bright and early, 7, 15 a.m. to read the rest of chapter 10. So Saturday, we can get into chapter 11. Start breaking down Revelation. She okay? She normally perky. She quiet today. Yeah, she fine. She mad that I said something to her about, uh, uh, about my coffee creamer. She mad that I said something to her about it. She wanted to do what she wanted to do, but she mad I called her out on it. Ain't that right? <laughs> All right, y'all. Laverne said, love your butterfly charm, Bella. See, she said she love your butterfly charm. Say, thanks, Laverne. She kind of said it under her breath. She peed with me right now. All right, y'all. Well, if you're going to be teed with me, I'm going to go ahead and end this video today, sis. All right, y'all. See y'all tomorrow. Bright and early. 7.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Breeze. Yeah, she teed with me. She ain't going to do peace. You ain't going to do the breeze with me. No. You're just ready to go. She's super mad. She is.